Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this one we take a closer look on how to render boxes with WebGPU. As you can see I have prepared some examples with different colors, sizes and textures and with a basic point light. All of this is done with the WebGPU API. Feel free to take a look at the GitHub for more details. You can check out the source code and run it yourself. Just make sure you use a browser which supports WebGPU. Let's get the basics straight. For our box, we must define vertices. A vertex is a point within a 3D space. Several vertices in a specific order draw triangles, which are then named faces. So here you see a list of all vertices for a cube. Then each vertex has a normal vector. This vector points upwards from the face. With that you know into which direction the face is facing. This is in particular useful for light shading and reflections. Assuming you have a light source, for simplicity reasons assume it's a point light, and the face is pointing towards the light, it gets highlighted. The more it faces away from the light, the darker it gets. And also there is the UV coordinate for each vertex. This UV maps the vertex position on a 2D position. With that UV coordinate you can sample a texture and use the texture color to draw a fragment. Having those informations, in WebGPU you create a vertex buffer. Fill the buffer with this data and provide it to the GPU. This buffer is used by shader programs to calculate the state and the color of a fragment that is a pixel of an object. There are more parameters to describe the state of the cube within the 3D space. The cube can be moved to another XYZ position. In geometry this process is called translation. Then you can rotate the cube on all three axes. Also you can scale the cube on all three axes. I am going to explain later how these things can be implemented. Also you notice that the cube has a color with RGB values. The color will be stored to a WebGPU buffer and used by the shader program to determine the color of a cube fragment. The state of the cube is changing over time, so every frame I am creating two transformation matrices. For that I am using the GL matrix library, which provides all the linear algebra utilities which I need. The first matrix contains the translate and rotate information. This matrix is applied to the vertex position. With that we know the position of the current fragment the shader is drawing. The second matrix contains only rotation. This is used to rotate the normal vector. These matrices are written to a buffer every frame and used by the shader programs to draw and shade the cube. Also there is the camera. It can be described by two components, the view matrix and the projection matrix. The view matrix describes the position and the orientation of the camera. With that you have a point of view within the 3D space. The projection matrix is needed to project the 3D world onto a 2D plane. With the values field of view, aspect ratio, near and far borders, vertices are either clipped outside of the viewable space or remain within the viewable space. Multiplying both matrices creates a camera transformation matrix. Because the camera is moving, this matrix is updated and uploaded to a WebGPU buffer every frame. Later in the shader program you will see that the cube transformation matrix and the camera transformation matrix will be used on the vertex position. And this is a basic scene. It has an array of cubes. We can add as many cubes as we want. Also it has a single point light. It has an X, Y and Z position which can change over time. This position is uploaded to a WebGPU buffer every frame and is available to all cubes globally. This position will be used by the shader program to make light shading. So with that we can summarize that we have two global buffers, one for the light position and one for the camera transformation matrix. This buffer data is updated every frame. And then we have buffers per cube. The color and the vertex data is uploaded only once, while the matrices are updated every frame. Optionally we want to upload a texture for the cube, this is also done only once. Now on to creating a renderer. Given an HTML canvas element we create a swap chain, which is the way how GPU draws colors to the canvas. We create a so called render pass descriptor, which has the color attachment. Here the swap chain comes into place during the render loop. 
Also, the descriptor has a death stencil attachment. It prevents from overlapping pixels improperly. And also, we allocate two global buffers, one for the camera transformation matrix and one for the light position. These global buffers will be used by all object shaders. The render pass descriptor and the buffers are only created initially. The renderer has a function to draw a frame. This function will be called every time a frame can be drawn. The first thing I am going is getting the current camera transformation and the current light position of the scene and writing it to the corresponding buffers. Then I am initializing the render pass. After that I am telling all objects of the scene to draw themselves. We get to that later. And at last I am submitting the render pass and the GPU is doing the work. Before we can render objects we must create them. Every object must have a render pipeline. The pipeline has two stages. Each executes its own shader programs. The first is the vertex stage. This stage is there to calculate the current vertex by using the vertices data from the vertex buffer. Here you set the shader module by providing the shader source code. We get to the shader source code later. Also you provide details about the vertex buffer. As described in the beginning, a vertex is described by a position, a normal vector and a UV. The array stride is the byte number of one vertex data within the vertex buffer. We map data within the stride to shader location indices. At index 0 we have three float numbers, which are the vertex positions. At index 1, with the offset of three float numbers, we have the normal vector data. After that with index 2 and with correct byte offset, we have the UV coordinates. With these indices, the shader program can access those values. Later we see how this is done in the shader program. The second stage of the pipeline is the fragment stage. A fragment is created by rasterizing the triangle to be drawn. Here we have a shader program which calculates the current fragment's color. We also say that we draw triangles and use backface culling. With backface culling, triangles which are facing away will not be rendered. And by configuring the death stencil, we say that fragments which are closest to the camera are rendered in front. Having the render pipeline covered, let's take a look at the buffers. Here I am creating a buffer for vertices, for the transformation matrices and for the cube color. The vertex buffer is created in a mapped state, so I can write data immediately to the buffer. I am writing every vertex data array one by one. I multiply the vertex position by scale factors. This way I am able to resize the cube on every axis. The transformation matrix buffer is created, but writing to it will be done when drawing a frame. The color buffer is also created in a mapped state. The RGB values are written into the buffer and then never changed again. These buffers are assigned to a bind group by adding them to a bind group entry array. Here every buffer gets a binding index. With that index the shader program can access that buffer and use its data. If we are creating a cube with a texture, given an image bitmap, we also create a GPU texture object, write the bitmap to the texture and create a sampler. The texture and the sampler are added to the bind group entries array and also get a binding index so they can be used by the shader. And at last, the actual bind group is created given the entries and it will be used when drawing a frame. The renderer is telling the cubes to draw themselves by calling this function here. At the beginning, the object updates its current transformation and rotation only matrices. The object provides its render pipeline. And then the current values of the matrices are written to the buffer. At last we set the vertex buffer, we set the bind group so the shaders will get the data from the buffers and call the draw function of the pass encoder so it starts using the vertices to draw. So now let's have a look at the shader programs. WebGPU is using the WebGPU shading language or short WGSL. It has its own syntax. Within the shader program you have access to system controlled resources, to buffer data and you can use mathematical functions such as sine, cosine, power of and square root. And it has built-in types for vectors and matrices which we will use. 
By looking at it, it looks like C program. At the top you define structures, global variables, and then you have a main method, which has an input and an output. Defining structures with the keyword block in double square brackets means this data structure is the content of a buffer. I have defined a structure which contains two 4x4 matrices, that is the vertex transformation matrix and the rotation only matrix. Then I have a structure for the camera buffer, which has only the camera transformation matrix. And below that a structure which has a three-dimensional vector, which is the color buffer, containing the red, green, blue values. Below that I define variables using those structures. In double square brackets I say which binding group and binding index to use to get the desired buffer. The variable gets the corresponding structure I have defined above as a type. This way you can access buffer data and structure them so you can work with them. Then I have defined two other structures, which represent the input and the output of this shader program. The input structure is using the location keyword in double square brackets. This keyword denotes user-defined input and output. At location 0 I expect a three-dimensional vector, at location 1 another one, and at location 2 a two-dimensional vector. This is the data from the vertex buffer, as you may remember. In the output structure I use the same keyword to denote output to the fragment shader program. I am setting the color, normal vector, UV and the current position. There is also another member having the output vertex position. It uses the keyword built-in position. The built-in keyword provides access to system controlled information. The system is expecting a vertex position as an output of this program. In the main program I am multiplying the input vertex position with the transformation matrix and with the camera transformation matrix. This calculated position is assigned to the structure member annotated with the built-in position keyword. So with that the system can decide what to do with it. Also I am providing this new position as an input to the next shader stage, the fragment stage. I am also rotating the normal vector by using the rotate only matrix, so I can use it for light shading. Additionally, I set the UV and the color so it can be used by the next fragment shader. So it is finally all coming together to the fragment shading. I create the fragment shader program by conditional string concatenation. If we use a texture, the shader program slightly looks different. Right here I add some binding for the 2D texture and the texture sampler, but only if this object is having a texture. Also the return statement looks slightly different. If we use a texture, we return a sample of the 2D texture and multiply it with a lighting factor. Without a texture, we return the fragment color from the previous shader stage, multiplied by the lighting factor. I define a structure which contains the point light position and bind it to a variable. Also I define a fragment input structure using the location keyword to retrieve the output of the previous stage. I have a hard coded ambient light factor so that the fragment is never completely dark, even if it's not illuminated by the point light. So finally in the main program I subtract the input position vector from the light position vector to get the direction towards the light. Then do the dot product of the light direction and the normal vector. With that we get the Lambert factor and finally determine the lighting factor and use it to render the final color of this fragment. So putting it all together we have a simple 3D cube rendering engine. We can add several cubes to the scene. Each one can have different color or texture, different positions, rotations and scales. In the animation loop we can animate the objects and the light. Feel free to check out the source code on GitHub, try it out yourself.